My name is Jefferson Fernandez. I'm a neurologist and director of the education program of the International Society for Telemedicine and Health. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this session and I will present some introductory words. The International Society's mission is to facilitate the international dissemination of knowledge in the telemedicine and e-health uh, space and providing access to recognized uh, experts in the field of digital health worldwide, and also bring you experiences in these uh, topics. The International Society, recognizing the importance of education, training, telemedicine, and digital health, has created the International Society's Education Program. And it's my honor to be appointed as the first director of this uh, program. Among the proposed of the education program is the coordination and management of the overlapping education activities of all society's organs, working groups, the consortium of educational institutions in digital health, known as CONEDIC, and the students' membership. Another purpose of the education program is to foster key education and training projects in the telemedicine and digital health fields, building education programs in partnership with institutions, organizations, and also proprietary activities such as course, workshops, and webinars. So here we are in this webinar, improving global health through digital health accreditation, organized it jointly with EUREC, corporate member of International Society, and with the participation of the International Society Working Group Standards and Accreditation for Telehealth Services, chaired by our colleague Neya Brentici. Without further ado, I give the floor to Malcolm Fisk uh, from our society to introduce himself and moderate this panel. Malcolm, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Jefferson. Um, I'm looking forward to all the presentations. I've just got a very uh, short presentation to make. I, by the way, am a professor of aging and digital health at uh, De Montfort University. I've had a long association with the International Society for Telemedicine and uh, eHealth, and I'm on the working group that Jefferson just mentioned regarding uh, standards. Um, and uh, uh, part of my record is in, includes leading two European Commission funded projects, uh, the first one around uh, telehealth and developing a, uh, what has become the International uh, Code of Practice for Telehealth Services, um, and the second one, the more recent one, to do with uh, older people and ICT and the standards uh, that are applicable or appropriate to ageing the aging population in a whole range of different domains. So that's me. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and uh, hopefully this will be um, fairly easily done. Here we go. Right. Whoops. All right. Right, okay, well, I'm going to try and uh, just start to answer, but uh, the next hour will actually answer probably things in a bit more detail. But what's happening in telehealth today? What is influencing the world of standards that we are addressing in this uh, webinar? Um, you know a lot of the things I'm going to say, but nevertheless, I think we should uh, just indicate some of them in order to grasp the scope and the breadth uh, that is necessary for the world of standards to address as we have a, a range of advancing uh, technologies. Now, and with those advancing technologies are, of course, different changes in design and capabilities, and they are increasing um, the proportion and number of uh, technologies that people like me and you can use in our own home. And uh, there are some questions about the extent to which those technologies do actually give the user, the patient, the citizen uh, control over what they do. And I have to just drop in a mention there of AI, artificial intelligence, because there are more and more things perhaps uh, with the technologies that it's difficult to fully understand, especially when you have uh, machine learning. So there are some questions about how we um, frame uh, within uh, standards or how we regulate uh, for the control of data and the use of data within those kinds of, of contexts. And people, yes, they do have much greater access to 
um, technologies and many people are um, empowered or enabled by those uh, technologies because they're more affordable, they're more available, uh, more usable very often if the designs are right. And, uh, and, and yes, so, so they're, they're, um, people are more um, familiar with the technologies and more ready to have them in their home. And many people, of course, are taking up the opportunity of, of self-managing their health to a greater extent than was the case in the past. Um, this means that there is uh, changing, there are changing services and the requirements uh, um, for those services are changing because of the nature of the different conditions and vulnerabilities for people of all ages, not just older people, though older people will be very much a part of our focus. And it means we also have some changing relationships between people, the services and the technologies. I could have perhaps put in uh, governments and uh, public bodies there as well um, as uh, clearly providing a strategic framework within which people, services and technologies interrelate. And this also means, and again, it's a, it's a challenge for the standards bodies, that there are different roles that are being taken on. Roles are, are morphing, they're changing. The doctors, pharmacists, nurses, implementation, occupational therapists, and many more people in the health uh, and clinical and telehealth fields. So I believe that we are actually in a time of a paradigm shift taking place. There was slow change happening, but clearly the COVID pandemic has pushed things forward in a very dramatic undesirable way but nonetheless it's got some outcomes there which I think we are going to be taking on board today. Um, it does mean that there's um, uh, change thinking around service operation not just because of people needing to be protected against uh, the virus but also with regard to giving people more choices and empowering them and so forth and implications again I just mentioned them governments, procurers, um, commissioners of services and providers have got to rethink uh, what they are doing as well. So, but whatever is happening, all these different things that are happening, I think one thing that we will all agree on uh, within the world of standards, within the world of telehealth, is that service and product quality remains paramount. And that, with the meaning of that word quality, we perhaps might debate a little bit, but certainly an element of it is around personal data and the protection of people's personal data, as well as all the other parameters of, of safety and quality that we recognize from the past. It means the standards will and must retain their place because all the, uh, by adapting in the light of some of these new norms about uh, services and people's behaviors and people's expectations and can actually encourage the providers of services to, um, uh, to, to put forward their frameworks and their services in a way that will empower and enable people and patients in new kinds of ways. And the external assessment and accreditation of those services also becomes uh, important as well as the, ensuring that stamp of quality, uh, which people will recognize and trust, and at the same time standards also fostering the changes that hopefully will, will bring us to a point where we have some interesting and different um, kinds of services uh, over the next uh, decade or so. Thank you very much for that. Um, I can stop sharing my, my screen and uh, just uh, move on uh, to the first of our, our main speakers, and which are in fact uh, Caroline and, and Hoda. And um, I shall introduce them very briefly uh, together, actually. Uh, first of all, um, with regard to Carolyn, um, this is uh, for Glue Care and also the Ain Shams Virtual Hospital. Uh, Caroline, Carolyn um, is Director of Nursing and Patient Experience, uh, and sh she is tuned into many of the cultural issues about services and the way that we provide them. Um, and the way that those cultures impact on, on care provision, which is also an expert in, in community me medicine. These are very brief introductions, by the way. You can obviously take a look at their profiles and learn a bit more about them. Um, and uh, Hoda, Associate Professor of Geriatrics and Gerontology at the um, Ain Shams uh, uh, University, uh, very well published on a huge range of areas in relation to older people from diabetes um, to dementia. So, so there's no doubt whatsoever that uh, our first two speakers um, are very well informed around some of these agendas and we will be listening carefully and thinking about the implications for standards frameworks uh, to what they say. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Carolyn, as you mentioned, I'm with Blue Care Integrated Diabetes Center. Um, you can tell by the accent that I'm not from the, the Emirates. 
I'm from the United States. I came with a, a big background in healthcare, moved here and found um, very surprising that healthcare was so advanced here in the UAE in many respects. They had hospitals and um, clinics and all kinds of healthcare that was brought in from all different parts of the world. And as I, you know, as started as a, a patient seeing the different healthcare and then working in hospitals and facilities, I noticed that there was a wide variation in healthcare from where people started to, you know, where, where they came from, how they started things. The, the government had regulations that were different in the different Emirates. And I found that there was not a lot of consistency, you know, in, in healthcare and facilities. Um, I just started on a policy committee in, in one of my facilities and, you know, even the terms should and must were different, had different meanings from different countries. And so I found that this lack of standardization in all aspects in, in healthcare was really difficult, challenging and, and a problem. And when you added in the, the cultural aspects behind it, it really was lacking in standardization. And so when I was, um, I moved to Dubai from Abu Dhabi and started a, a clinic by myself and you know, with, with a team, um, we decided we really needed some standardization in what we were doing. And so, you know, of course we, we looked at the various methods for accreditation and, um, and we found that, you know, I had experience in many areas, but when it came to telemedicine, telehealth, rem remote patient monitoring, I really felt like it was kind of a black hole for me. Even though I'd been in healthcare for years, it, it was very different for me. And when I found, I first um, looked up URAC and I started looking at some of the standards, I could tell from just the initial questions that they asked, it was like, oh, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. There's many things about, you know, IT security that I knew nothing about. And I really feel that, you know, seeking accreditation and using a standard platform helped bring us into a real good place, you know, and that we were able to implement best practices from the very beginning. And I just, all I can say is that I really feel like the standardization is needed in all the facilities in this area. And it's not that they're bad. But I think that if we brought standardization, we would have a really, we'd be in a good place and make sure that best practices are, are being employed. And um, I think that that really would benefit, especially a place here in the UAE where things are so new, um, and so varied and so different. It's um, my, our path for accreditation was wonderful. Um, it was supportive. It was, um, it was friendly, you know, some, sometimes you go into accreditations with a, a fear and it wasn't like that with your act. And I really feel like, um, it was a learning process, um, a learning curve. We, we um, implemented a few best practices and I, I, I'm looking forward to continuing the journey throughout, uh, learning more as we go along. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. And uh, over to Hoda, please. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, allow me to share my uh, presentation. First of all, thank you very much, Professor Fisk, for the introduction. And thank you all for the opportunity to be able to contribute to this webinar. Um, I will be sharing the experience of Ain Shams University Virtual Hospital, or AVH for short, uh, in our accrediting our telemedicine services. Uh, I am, as uh, Professor Fisk said, I have a background in geriatric medicine, but I'm also the chief medical officer of uh, AVH. Actually, AVH is an institute affiliated to Ain Shams University in Egypt, and it specializes in developing technology-enabled healthcare services, and telemedicine is one of our main uh, domains that we work in. Um, well, of course, we can all uh, agree on that accreditation is a confirmation of quality. Um, and it's a way to ensure that um, our ultimate goal of value-based care is... Um, I'm sorry, I just have my, my picture over the presentation. Okay, so it's a way to attain our uh, ultimate goal of value-based care where uh, we have a diversity in clinical and business models. 
And we can also agree that accreditation is not only aiming for telemedicine providers, it also benefits users who are patients and physicians. We all remember the chaos that started with um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think the, the chaos was because we didn't have a plan in treating COVID-19. We didn't have a, a medical plan on how to treat patients. We didn't have a plan how to um, uh, welcome patients to the hospital, who to, in, to admit and who to discharge. We didn't have a plan when physicians and healthcare professionals became ill, how to uh, fill this gap. So uh, not having a plan is part of the chaos that happened. Uh, ADH started the telemedicine services in 2017, and we worked with whatever resources that we had, and it was quite tedious to uh, try to convince everyone uh, with the benefits of telemedicine and um, not being able to reimburse the physicians, and uh, patients also were skeptical. Um, actually, we were working or um, providing telemedicine services on our own responsibility, and we had little support from the administration, and therefore we didn't have any formal marketing. So to prevent the chaos that, um, that can happen, like what happened with the COVID-19, we, we stopped for a moment and thought, are we actually um, doing it correctly? Is anyone at risk? Um, uh, are we actually doing what should be done? Should we persuade people so hard to, to receive telemedicine services and um, uh, to give telemedicine services? So to answer all those questions, we uh, thought we should have, or we should go through the journey of accreditation to make sure that actually we are answering all these questions. And I'm happy to tell you that after the accreditation process, we didn't just answer these questions, we uh, even had more wins than we expected. So uh, as my colleague uh, Caroline was saying, best practice is the main uh, issue as this is a medical practice. So uh, actually we made sure through the accreditation process that all the physicians were practicing telemedicine according to the available guidelines. And because um, it's a university hospital, we were able also to persuade uh, the physicians to have research uh, projects where the telemedicine guidelines were deficient over the world. And uh, also because of the accreditation process, we were able to put down the business model into uh, on paper and to introduce it to the administration and make sure that it was clear to everyone what the business model was. One of the great benefits, um, maybe a personal benefit because I'm responsible for the executive part was uh, the workflows. And I'm not just talking about the workflows, the telemedicine workflow and its integration into the healthcare services that we offer. I'm also talking about the workflows for training the physicians, credentialing them, the marketing procedures that we had, uh, how to market the content and everything, risk management, management quality assurance and improvement in collaboration with our quality uh, management team. So once I had everything um, uh, written down, organized, it was there, but it wasn't as organized as after the accreditation. It was very easy and very efficient, and recruiting other members that could do this job made it much, much easier and made it sure that we're all doing the same thing the same way. Another important point was uh, the competence, competency of the physicians or providers that we had on board. Of course, telemedicine is a new uh, or relatively new uh, uh, um, way of offering healthcare services. So none of us actually did have any uh, formal training in telemedicine when we were in college or um, even postgraduate. So we, wait, uh, we wanted to make sure that all physicians had some sort of uh, minimal set of skills uh, to be able to know or to be aware of what telemedicine is and what it offers. Despite after COVID, uh, uh, telemedicine has been used widely. A lot of physicians still are not aware of what telemedicine is and how to use it. So one of our great achievements that we never thought accreditation would, ha would help us with was that we have now an undergraduate course that is offered to our um, students. And it was very successful last year. Uh, this year, they gave us even more credit hours. And uh, we're thinking of having it for all years and even as a postgraduate course also. Uh, I've also been requested to provide some sort of um, training, even if people are not going to, uh, to practice telemedicine for senior staff also. Uh, another important point is that we wanted to make sure that telemedicine as a tool is actually increasing access to healthcare services. So to make sure that actually it is um, fulfilling this part, we, we had to make sure that people knew that we had a telemedicine service and how to use it. And this was through our marketing campaigns. And we had some awareness campaigns when the COVID um, 
pandemic started to um, to become um, less invasive, um, a lot of awareness campaigns in the clinics, uh, some of our students went there and uh, talked to the patients and told them the benefits and the limitations of telemedicine, how to use it, and it was very successful. These campaigns were very successful. Um, access was not just to increase healthcare access, but to increase the access of users to telemedicine. It doesn't make sense if I have a telemedicine service um, that's excellent, but not, yeah, neither the physicians nor the patients um, know how to use it. So over the, the last year, we've been developing um, our service very much. That's, it has become so user-friendly. Even sometimes um, people with minimal um, knowledge are able to use the, the services. Um, they have confidence now with the awareness campaigns and with the marketing. They know how to use it. And the adoption of the users has increased exponentially. Um, it was also important for the patients to know that the telemedicine service is not a standalone service. So when we had the workflow that explained that this is integrated in the general healthcare services of uh, Ain Shams University Hospitals, they felt that they won't have to have two physicians managing them or two lines of management uh, for them. So we, we made sure that there was a continuity of care for the patients. Uh, two points that actually we didn't expect um, uh, telemedicine to help us help uh, sorry the um, the accreditation process to help us with was the financial legal parts. Um, so far, we are not um, patients are not paying for the service, and the Inchams University is doing it as a community service. Um, we don't have still proof of um, cost effectiveness, but uh, they have been persuaded to do research in this domain, and also. Um, it was enough for them to know that patients, the number of patients presenting to the ER and to the um, uh, to the uh, clinics, to the outpatient clinics, will be decreasing with the telemedicine service. So this was enough for them. Plus, um, we are hoping to persuade the insurers because we have a new insurance program for patients uh, to be able to um, uh, to include telemedicine uh, in it. And then I was surprised actually two days ago that I got a tax, um, um, uh, an email from the taxes, even though that we're not uh, asking patients for money, but it meant that we are in the system, which was good. Uh, one of also the wins that we never thought of was because when we started talking to funding um, uh, bodies, when we told them that we were accredited by a renowned um, uh, accrediting body, URAC, um, actually it, we, more, more, we were more credible and they were hoping to give us the funds uh, and we had a better chance than when we weren't accredited. Regarding the legal part, actually, we were um, approved by the Supreme Council of hospital, University Hospitals in Egypt, but also accreditation gave us um, an add value. Um, and we have been invited because of the accreditation to, uh, to contribute to the drafting of the legislation of telemedicine in Egypt, because actually we aren't legislated yet. Um, it has also helped us uh, with the across-border uh, telemedicine consultations, especially in countries where also telemedicine isn't legislated yet. So um, we usually have a lot of consultations, institutional um, agreements uh, with African um, universities. And um, this has helped us to write or draft the agreements better because now we know what are the terms and conditions that have to be included that ensure patient safety and physician safety. And also for the third party technology providers, also th those agreements are more, much more mature than they were in the beginning. So this is a quick um, look at the wins. And as you can see, we've won a lot from uh, the accreditation, thanks to Iraq. And I'm looking forward to accrediting the rest of our telemedicine services uh, that we're currently developing. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, th thank you very much, um, Hoda and uh, Carolyn. So some UAE and Egyptian perspectives there, and we'll pick up um, later on uh, with various uh, questions, uh, I'm sure, especially um, bearing in mind what we just heard about the impact of actually going through the accreditation process as, as being actually serving some additional purposes about uh, raising awareness and helping uh, service uh, integration. So, so a lot of positives there, which we'll pick up on. Uh, now we're moving on to um, a more, well, to, to uh, uh, Nea Brencic, um, who is uh, closely embedded with some of the work and the leader of the um, standards and accreditation working group within the International Society. 
Um, she leads a, a non-profit institute in uh, Slovenia, uh, which is uh, very much concerned with uh, human rights issues and so forth. And uh, she's got quite a lot of experience with regard to AAL. And those of you who work in Europe will be familiar with the term um, active and assisted living. Uh, she's a, a psychologist uh, by training. And, uh, and yes, and, and lots of other things, no doubt, which I haven't mentioned. But I'll pass over to you, uh, to you Naya, and let's hear what you have to tell us. Uh, Malcolm, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, it's a great honor actually to be uh, in this company and to be able to present uh, a very uh, dear topic uh, to me, as uh, Malcolm has uh, mentioned, that we are, um, myself, I'm uh, concerned much about the end user experience. And thus I see uh, the standardization and accreditation processes as uh, beneficial um, to the end user. Um, now, let me share, um, let me share the presentation. Okay. I'm not sure this is the best one. <laughs> Sorry. Share again. Okay. Okay, this is not going the way I want it, but <laughs> I will do it another way. Can you see now the presentation? Not yet. Not yet. We did see it briefly. Okay, let me try again. Mm -hmm. I think it's not in the play mode yet. Ah, this one, yes, thank you, Malcolm, always helpful. <laughs> so um, standards and accreditation for telehealth services is the, um, my address, uh, and I want to present uh, the, main, the main thought uh, that I have for today is that uh, these standards and accreditation for telehealth services do improve the quality of patient-centric telehealth services worldwide. Wide. And so the, the vision that we have within the, um, the working group is that um, we want to provide, we want to provide the environment where stakeholders can work together to create standards and associated frameworks to improve the quality of patient-centric telehealth services worldwide. Uh, also, um, a very important aspect is trust. So we want to provide the environment where we can build trust for clinicians, health, social care, and support professionals and practitioners um, so we can all um, contribute to this environment where telehealth services can improve for the benefit of uh, the end user. So what the, uh, our working group uh, builds on is the VHO Global Strategy for Digital Health, also, the, because we are in Europe, we focus maybe a little bit more on the EU, EU Action Plan for eHealth 2020. Uh, a very important, uh, that's why I'm uh, stressing this one, is ESO uh, TS 1331 and the International Codes of Practice with Patient-Centric Design. So you can see uh, the presentation of this patient-centric um, focus also on this uh, slide with a little green person in the middle. So that's our focus. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is. So our mission. Um, is to work on some of the objectives that you can see down here. So the technology, innovation, business, and professional. Uh, but the mission in general is uh, to enable the exchange of knowledge and experience among stakeholders in relation to service quality, appropriate standards and codes of practices, um, certification, accreditation procedures, and policies for telehealth services. So again, um, this is the environment we Next slide, please. Can you someone 
Okay, thank you. So just to put some faces uh, with, with the activities, um, Frederick, myself, and Malcolm and Drago uh, are the ones who uh, sort of initiated this uh, idea within the uh, ISFTEH um, society. Uh, there were other working groups working on some um, similar as aspects uh, also, but we wanted uh, specifically to work on standards and accreditation to enable this environment. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, and we all, all, all know that the COVID-19 emergency um, brought forward some, some of the important um, uh, things that we need to work on. Um, and as was mentioned before, uh, that although it's a, an, um, it's not a good situation, but I think that we as um, human <laughs> humans, <laughs> as people, we came forward with such um, great um, innovative uh, things that we could see in the last two years. Um, and uh, I think that we really contributed a lot with these innovative things to the um, overall um, development of um, telehealth uh, services. Um, so I think um, that some good things came out um, when we work together on these subjects. Um, what does standardization bring to users? Um, that is, for me, the top priority question. Um, I think that uh, underlines uh, the whole quality of uh, the services. And so the standards uh, that are particular for each service should be implemented um, in, all, uh, in all services. I, need to, I think that we need to uh, really encourage um, also from, from the national strategies up to European and international strategies to work on this, um, on this um, topic. Uh, also, we can see some good ex examples. As I said, we came up with pretty innovative uh, things in the international environment. Uh, we can see some examples of standards, um, of good practices of environments that have um, come together, um, the working groups. And um, so it's rather exciting to, to be in this place to see um, such development going on. Um, as I mentioned, yes, the uh, digital health strategies and the benefits of standardizations, these are important um, to work from, from the national strategies up and also down from the VHO and EU strategies to um, implement uh, these aspects into the um, everyday life. Basically, we need to really work hard. I see here in Slovenia how much it takes, uh, how much effort it takes to just maybe pass one law that will, for example, um, enable um, a telemedical service to be um, reimbursed by, uh, by um, end user or hospital. So just for one little step, so much effort need, needs to be done, but it is possible and it's, a, it's an ongoing process, but we, we can see some uh, good things happening also nationally and internationally. Um, so uh, as a concluding thought, I think uh, I come back uh, every time to the person, to the person next to me, to the person now in the hospital, to uh, my relative, to somebody that I know. And I think about how um, technology can benefit this person in this moment. And this brings me again, gives me strength to work on these um, important aspects also as uh, standardization. Um, and accreditation, uh, as mentioned before uh, by Hoda. Um, I think that uh, it, it does, it, it brings benefits and, um, and we can see this uh, in our everyday uh, interaction with hospitals, with medical workers, with um, even the politicians, the uh, decision makers. Uh, but we need to bear in mind that uh, the, the center um, is on the person, is on the human. So we um, 
as much as we love what we do, as much as it is good to see some technological aspect that works, um, we also have a, a living lab here at the, um, at the facilities in Izris. Uh, and it's great to see when something comes together, like when, when some uh, devices work, uh, when some smart watches work, um, when an SOS uh, uh, button uh, that is uh, integrated somewhere at uh, some facilities, you know, that everything works. The technology uh, is great and it's exciting, uh, but uh, I, I need to think about uh, who actually benefits uh, from this in what way and where is uh, necessary the most. And this is where the standards of services come in uh, that we need to uh, see implemented. So this is all from my side. Thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the questions that might arise from this. So thank you very much, uh, Naya. Um, to, I, I just want to mention a couple of points very, very briefly. Um, you emphasize trust, which is important. Who benefits? Another question, which we may pick up uh, under questions as well. And an interesting one about um, the objectives of the um, working group within the International Society um, to stimulate innovative ideas for telehealth. Um, now, and one of the criticisms sometimes that's made of standards is they kind of uh, trap things into a particular mold. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, our next speaker, um, Sean, uh, has to say um, about, uh, Sean Griffin has to say about that. He's CEO, I think, of, uh, of URAC, um, and certainly has great expertise in the area of um, telehealth and accreditation. Also, I notice uh, health informatics. So, so maybe he's got some reassurance he can give me personally when I worry about all the challenges for people's personal data. Um, Sean, over to you. Malcolm, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, ISF. T E H. I always want to get all the, the letters in there for, for being on this webinar with us. I'm Dr. Sean Griffin. I'm the president and CEO at ERAC. That's Washington, D.C. in the morning out there behind me. Um, I think this is a, a great panel, and, and the things that have been brought up have been just remarkable. I'm going to share my screen and, and uh, show some of the things, uh, just go through some slides pretty briefly here. Um, but I, I think that as we look at what we're seeing in telemedicine, um, the, there's there's the, the role of accreditation and accreditation we've been doing accreditation for, for many years now back before the pandemic and what we really see is, is that accreditation uh, helps to ensure quality care for patients worldwide we started off with just focused on the United States and actually have been invited to go overseas and we're thrilled that we have this chance to shape it because if, if you look at at uh, at countries if you look at states here in the United States you're seeing incredible variation there's things in the regulations in a state there's things in the regulations in a country there's things that are, are common practice and we see accreditation as being able to provide that flexible framework for setting a standard for quality across the, the whole world and we often say regulation sets the bar for safety but accreditation sets the bar for quality and i'm going to talk about that um, briefly here um, Premier is the accreditor of, of telehealth and remote patient monitoring programs. We accredit 13 of the top 20 hospitals in the United States for one of our programs. You know, we, we've been doing this for quite a while and we're, we're honored to work with the organizations that we've been able to work with. When you think about our digital health programs, and this is going from what used to be telemedicine and it was a focus on the technology to where it's about the health of people. And it's not just about medicine, it's about wellness. It's about, you know, monitoring somebody who has uh, diabetes and making sure that they're well controlled, someone with hypertension, or providing uh, care for facilities that can't otherwise have specialist access. So we're seeing these models, and I saw a mention in the chat about, about the various models that we're seeing, and our standards really are, are pretty flexible. Uh, we think that, that accreditation is that quality framework. It, it brings up things that you might not think of otherwise. We had a number of organizations who, during the pandemic, they told us, they said we were accredited before, and when the pandemic hit, we had all of these questions about how we were going to do things, and we went back to our answers to the accreditation process process and the things that you helped us to build and that prepared us for this moment. We also think that that accreditation is not about passing a test in a moment in time. It's about setting up a quality framework and having quality improvement that you do. Um, it's independent third party verification. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say that you're great. It's to have it's another thing to have someone else check it out and make sure that you actually measure up. And and a, a number of organizations, most of the large organizations that you would hear of in the United States who are doing telemedicine or telehealth have gone through our accreditation and and as hoda said you know there there is this credibility that you have for going through a 
accreditation and to, to set yourself up as a leader. And, and accreditation right now is a way. There are some places that are requiring it, but this really is about demonstrating your leadership in the field. And we're thrilled to work with organizations around the world uh, to do this work. Uh, we have our telehealth program. We also have a remote patient monitoring program. There, there are parts of that that are separate um, where, where you deal with telehealth or where you deal with remote patient monitoring, but there's a lot of overlap. So if you look at our standards and you can go to our website at urac.org and you can take a look at our standards at a glance and it lays out what we see as being a robust program because telehealth and remote patient monitoring aren't just about the devices. It's not just about protecting health information. It's not just about the, the clinical oversight. There's a lot of areas that make up telemedicine and telehealth and, and remote patient monitoring. And there's a lot of innovation going on right now. With the pandemic, there's been this innovation explosion in, in telehealth. And, and we really are seeing that our standards are flexible enough to, to let everybody in who, who wants to work at this in, in a good manner. And we're not carving people out out because they don't qualify. We're, we're updating our standards much more commonly than, than regulations are updated or those things because we are seeing this innovation. And so we act as a bit of a knowledge hub here in the United States and, and across the world for, for what are the emerging models that we're seeing. Um, when we updated our standards, we brought together a, a huge group of providers here in the United States, everything from children's hospitals to, to insurance companies, to the federal government, to uh, you know consumer technology association, employers, academic medical centers. Uh, it was just a really robust group that we brought together to take a look at what were our standards and how did the pandemic cause us to update them. We're actually on our third revision of our standards. Our standards are our 3.0 standards, and that's a sign of how we've been doing this for a while and how we update it as we see practice change. Uh, the elements of a quality telehealth program, if you look at this, this is much more than just a technology. It's much more than a video visit. It's everything from how you train your personnel over on the left side to how do you credential your providers? What's your quality management program? How do you, uh, you know, who oversees your program? Who's your technical director? Who's your clinical director? What are the scope of your services? What are your escalation agreements? For if you get on a, a call where you're expecting to deal with somebody who just has a cough and you get on there and the provider finds that they're having a heart attack. What do you do in those situations? How do you handle patient consent? How do you protect their information? Uh, how are you practicing evidence-based medicine? How are you following clinical guidelines? And then, then everything over to le managing your legal risk and those things. Um, I, I think that this shows the difference between what is a program that provides telemedicine versus the emphasis that I saw years ago as a, as a chief medical information officer, where it was about the platform. It was about having a video visit with a provider. And we, now now we know that a true patient-centered program is much more than simply a video call and having somebody appear on a camera because we know that, that, that bad medicine can be practiced on a good camera and we want to make sure that good medicine is being practiced uh, whatever the, the method of communication is or the way that you're connecting with your patients. Um, some of our digital health clients, we have a list here, some of the names that they are, are people that you've seen on the call today. You know, we were honored to work with these organizations and to, to, to show them what a robust program looks like and they educated us and we educated them and we work together. Uh, one of the things that's unique about URAC is we don't sell consulting services. If you come to us for an accreditation, we see that accreditation process as being educational and so we're not going to charge you consulting hours while we help you to get better and, and to meet our standards. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I think this was a, a great presentation. Thank you for listening to my topics. If you go to, to URAC.org, you can take a look at our standards. Here's my email address. Um, and I will just uh, turn it back over to Malcolm if he has any questions for me at this point, or if we're going to open it up for everybody's questions. Well, it, it, indeed. Thank you very much, Sean. We are going to open it up for everybody's questions for the, for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes. But to just pick up on one thing you said there, delighted to hear it. The program is more important than the platform. I think some people get too obsessed with the technologies sometimes and, and, uh, and think about what can be deployed, if you like, or, or issued to people in order to gather more information without seeing the whole picture, if I haven't say. Um, anyway, uh, sorry, that's just me um, letting off a little bit. Um, and uh, Fred, the flexible frameworks um, for, for accreditation. Sounds good to me. Um, okay, right. Um, how are we doing for any questions in the chat? Or perhaps not at the moment. Uh, I know there's a lot of chat going on, a lot of information being exchanged. Um, but now is the time to um, put a question in there if you have one. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, 
uh, Lisa or Laura is going to pick up on one of them there, in which case they can uh, draw my attention to it, or Jefferson even. Have you got a question, uh, Jefferson? Yeah, yes, I do have a question, Malcolm, but I would like to invite all speakers uh, to open their cameras so we can see all people together and have this uh, nice discussion that uh, I would like to first to ask a question for Caroline and Hoda. Uh, what uh, were the main challenges that you have faced uh, in the accreditation process? We might start with Hoda, then Caroline. Well, actually, whatever challenges we faced, I'm going to tell you a few of them, but uh, Iraq was very helpful. And I, I'm not just talking because Iraq accredited us, but uh, it's a lesson I learned myself. If I want someone to be successful, I have to help them with the challenges, not leave them to themselves and tell them you're, you can't be accredited because you weren't able to overcome your challenges. Well, first of all, the challenges were because uh, we had the COVID-19 in, um, uh, in the middle of our accrediting process, so we have to be very flexible in, in changing everything, changing our workflow, changing our paperwork. So this was a lot of work for us. We even became late and the deadline was, um, uh, was pushed a little bit. And um, of course we had the challenge of the, the financial part, uh, despite that Sean said that they don't get any um, money for their consulting services, but there was a certain fee that they were very um, generous to actually um, to lift off our shoulders and we didn't pay a penny. So um, that was very uh, interesting. Uh, another important point is that we were accredited for our uh, C2P services only. This was because we were still and still actually uh, developing the rest of our services. And maybe this is not a major challenge, but they were um, uh, nice enough to wait for us until we are going to finish uh, what we had. And we had also an extended deadline. So as I'm telling you, whatever the challenges were, they were actually um, simply finding solutions for our problems. And uh, this is, I really want to uh, have this chance to thank uh, the whole team, uh, starting from Sean to everyone else that really has helped us. I hope I've answered your question. Well, yes. Uh, very quickly, Huda, how long did your accreditation last for? And when, when would uh, you be called back in? Well, uh, I'm a gerontologist, so I have a very bad memory. <laughs> I think it was about a year. So, so accre accred accreditation is generally good for three years, is, is, is generally how long we accredit. And the, the process time period depends upon how you have the resources to do it. We try and do all of our accreditations in six months or less. Sometimes they take longer than that. Sometimes they're shorter than that. Um, but, but just our standard operating is, is six months for a three-year accreditation. Sorry, Jefferson, did you want to come in there? Sorry, can you say that again? Did you want to come in there with a, a, a follow-up? Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, no, it, it's very nice. I was just uh, uh, waiting to hear Caroline to say what were uh, her and their her team uh, challenges for the accreditation process. Um, you're on mute, Caroline. Sorry, it wasn't a really difficult process because we had a lot of help and a lot of steps along the way. Having been a nurse for 40 years, I really felt like, you know, the help with, um, you know, many of the aspects other than the IT security was pretty straightforward. Um, it helped me put things in a new perspective in a new light because I hadn't thought of them in terms of remote patient monitoring. You know, the policies and that had to change a little bit when we considered that there would be remote um, monitoring and a lot of digital communications. The IT security was kind of beyond me. We had, you know, um, we had outsourced our IT and then so we used them a lot to get things squared away. But even then, as we went through the accreditation process, um, even though they weren't here in the Middle East, they were very well aware of the security requirements that we have, how difficult it is. They um, recommended um, bringing in and using some of the European standards, which I hadn't thought of. Um, and so it was gathering this information in the field of which I knew basically nothing in that one area was a little challenging, but again, they had experts helping us. They were available at all times to do this. And it, I think it really helped us develop a, a very secure, safe, but also informative program that you know, we feel confident because in the UAE data security is a big issue. And so I feel very confident with our program now, whereas before 
you know, I kind of felt it was secure, but using their process and, and their systems and that really helped us be secure. That was our really only big challenge for me. Um, some of the points you've both made actually um, start to answer one of the questions that we have got in the chat, which is where to start with telehealth and what are the easiest fields in telemedicine to deploy telehealth to? Uh, for example, rehabilitation versus the management of chronic diseases. Um, because I guess um, uh, you were certainly looking for uh, some quick wins as far as uh, telehealth uh, implementation is concerned, um, or were you actually trying to take a rather broader, um, all-embracing perspective, or, or were you actually specialising in some fields, and are they easier to um, get people signed up to than others? Um, Carolyn and Hoda, quickly on those. Well, I can jump in here. When it comes to us, uh, you know, we're a diabetes centre. We deal with chronic care. We deal with um, diabetes as our main focus. You know, of course, there's comorbidities and things. So dealing with it as far as chronic care is concerned was, was very simple and straightforward. Um, our system's a little different. We don't do traditional telehealth services. We do remote patient monitoring where we have a proprietary, we call it a band, where we um, bring in outside data and we incorporate it directly into our EMR. And then we are able to bridge the gap. You know, in, in diabetes care, a patient comes in, they tell their physician all kinds of things that may or may not be true or accurate. Then they come back three months later and they're asked again, how did it go? And it's a black box. We know nothing about what happens in between them. But by remote patient monitoring, we monitor their sleep. We monitor their blood sugar levels. We monitor their food. They food log for us. And so when they come back in, they have all of this information, all this data incorporated directly into their EMR system. And we look at it together and it's like, you know, okay, you've been monitoring your blood sugars. Let's look at this pattern over time. Let's, um, you know, put all of this together. Let's look at how um, your, uh, your exercise after your meal impacted your blood sugar. And we can look at it and graph it and see it. So using it for remote patient monitoring as far as dealing directly with um, our patients was wonderful. We do want to move into telehealth services because, of course, you know, diabetes, as I'm sure um, Hoda will say, dealing with the elderly can be challenging, getting them out into appointments and that. We'd love to, to get into that. We haven't done that yet. We started easy with remote patient monitoring because we have our own proprietary system. Um, it was it really an excellent journey. It was a great starting point and we would like to move into to more accreditation and I would really appreciate the help. It's, uh, you know, a consulting service that we can use and be accredited at the same time. It was really effective. Oda, were you going to add something to that briefly? Uh, well, actually, we're a tertiary hospital, so uh, we were hoping to uh, introduce telemedicine, whatever, we can fill a gap in healthcare services. So we're not uh, focusing mainly on a specific specialty rather than where we can help and where we can fill the gap. That, that's really interesting. And can, can I come to Naya uh, as well, because for a more patient-oriented uh, perspective there, filling a gap. So actually, there's... Um, rather than challenging perhaps some of the existing uh, frameworks for um, healthcare provision, we're actually suggesting that uh, telehealth may reach a wider range of people or introduce people to healthcare services in, in new ways where they wouldn't have approached them before. Naya, any, any thoughts from the patient perspective here as to the relative acceptability of different uh, ways of um, services being offered? Uh, yes, maybe this is... Um... Like that, okay, maybe the hospitals can have all the, uh, the ways that they want to reach the patient, but then the patient doesn't feel um, uh, comfortable with using these services. And this is where we also need to, you know, think about how maybe in each country, even not, not so nationally, like each country, how they will approach and um, encourage their people, their maybe patients or future patients that will uh, be, you know, willing uh, to use these services because otherwise we lose, <laughs> um, we lose them. Yeah. And if they don't even feel comfortable about using them, I'm talking maybe about um, older patients or maybe 55 plus or so, uh, they're not uh, willing to use any um, technology when uh, transmitting or, you know, concerning their health data. 
um, or their health in general. So that's that's where we need to work um, a lot on the field with maybe um, end user um, organizations uh, to motivate and give them some experience, even uh, how it looks like and that it, it is not so terrible. <laughs> So when they need these services, they, they will not be reluctant to use them. Okay, no, thank you very much for that. Um, and obviously, you mentioned the word trust in your presentation, and that's obviously hugely important there, if you're going to encourage people to use the technological tools. And I, in my introduction, mentioned the issue about the technology design being something that's appropriate for people that they would accept within their homes and use. Um, and I like to talk about uh, technologies being as familiar as the refrigerator or something like that, so that they don't carry any stigma whatsoever, um, whereas some technologies can. Um, I, I'm being advised that there's a second question in the chat, but I can't actually see it. Would someone like to pick it up here? Well, there was, there was a question about how the standards are created, who who's responsible, how they come to be. Um, I, I think that may be the other question. You uh -huh. know, for, for us, initially, you start out with expert opinions. Then when you produce the standards, we put them out for public comment. With our most recent revision, I had that slide of all the organizations that participated in updating our standards. We thought that it was really important to have everyone from legal to federal government to, to payers to providers, uh, both academics and small facilities uh, that came together to, to update our standards. And then we again put them out for public comment. Um, they are revised and then they're presented, approved by our board. Uh, we are a multi-stakeholder board. We're not the arm of some organization. Um, so we, we think that it's pretty much consensus developed and then we put them out. There is the regulatory framework which sits underneath a number of our standards and we wanna be supportive of the regulations that apply in your jurisdiction. Um, but we also want to set a, a level higher than simply the minimum required by the regulations. And I think that when you talk about acceptance and support, both by by paying organizations and by by federal by government regulators, uh, we, we have have strong credibility. We've been doing standards in the U.S. for 30 years, and and that brings credibility to the work that we're doing. And when you look at who participates, it's just another sign of how we're, we're trying to do this in the right way and bring up the things that maybe you wouldn't think of on your own. Um, as, as an important factor for making this right for everyone. Right. Obviously, the word consensus appears a, a huge number of times in the world of standards. Um, and obviously, multiple stakeholders make consensus sometimes difficult to, to reach. So what were the main tensions then when you look at standards and the standards you're involved in, in helping uh, develop? Well, when, when you have multiple stakeholders, you, you have sort of their, their focus areas and you have, you have trying to balance, you know, new emerging technologies, previous technologies that are a little more time tested. And, and we really want to make sure that our standards are supportive of both what we see now, but also the innovation that we're seeing, because it's, it's the innovative models that very often mark the path that we're all going to be going, maybe even when we don't expect it. So our, our standards, you know, we, we have some of our standards right now in, in some of our programs that talk about AI and both the strengths and the limitations of AI and the restrictions on it. And so we're, we're trying to be um, uh, uh, adjusting to the new reality while also supporting what's tested and tried and true. Okay, thanks. And I've got two hands showing, uh, Jefferson first and then Hoda. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. Just take uh, the chance that Sean is, is talking. Uh, Sean, uh, what are the problems or situations that you face that are common to most or to all hostels that you uh, have accredited? Uh, readiness or, please, uh, like, I'd like you to expand on that. I, I need you to repeat the beginning of that. I, did you say privacy or? Was... Yeah, no, no. What are the common situations or problems oh, okay. that you face that are common to many so, hostels? So... So, so very often in the United States, you have a small group within a larger organization that has begun to do telehealth, whether it be a, a, a stroke unit or a chronic care unit, where you have a, a physician who is, is really a champion for, for doing that kind of care. And, and what we do is we go in and we say, all right, this is what you're doing, but if you did it more broadly, how would that change your model? And, and that's where we get into, you know, how are you training your physicians who are in medical school? How are you training your new medical staff? How are you integrating with your electronic medical record. It, it really is about taking it from being sort of a, a hobby to going to scale for a full organization is, is often the challenge that we see in some of the larger organizations. The other end of the spectrum is we have some small organizations who come out with a very focused particular type of care that they're doing. And, and, and when we, we have to challenge them and say, all right, you're doing this, but how does that apply to all care? How are you handling evidence-based medicine? How are you making sure that this is not simply um, a, a, a new, a 
new division of medicine, but it actually integrates with the overall patient care. And, and a, a patient-centered view sometimes is different than a disease-centered view. And, and we, we have to challenge organizations to think about the whole patient and, 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 and chronic situations, and not just this moment when they're on the camera for a sore throat. Sorry, very profound words. Hoda. I just wanted to comment on what Naya was talking about elderly and how they find difficulty using the technology. Actually, uh, during our practice, we found that um, age wasn't the main factor because some people are technology ignorant despite their age. Uh, but anyway, we wanted, because we have um, uh, large numbers of illiterate people, we had several uh, plans to, to target those people to increase their access to telemedicine services. So, of course, um, many people, whether they're elderly or not, we usually had the training done for their caregivers or someone who's educated or has a smartphone or so on and so forth. And currently, we're also developing like something like the one-minute clinic that's available in the States, uh, but we don't have a physician. We uh, have an operator, he's a pharmacist, and these units are present in pharmacies, and the operators um, are trying to help people download the applications, enter their data, whether they're technology illiterate or generally illiterate. So we are hoping that this is just something we're going to launch next month. So we hope this is going to increase um, um, uh, the access for telemedicine services. Ooh, sorry, Hoda, did you just mention a one-minute clinic? And if so, can you explain what it means? Well, uh, I thought it's well known in, in the States, there are these clinics that are available, especially um, in um, a large uh, pharmacy chains uh, like CVS and so on. And you can go there because you don't have the waiting lines for the outpatient clinics and the ER and so on. And there is a physician there, a general physician. Um, now, the rules in Egypt, I'm not so sure if we can um, um, launch a physician there in the pharmacies. So we thought of an alternative uh, plan where there's an operator who doesn't have any medical um, background. He's a pharmacist and he, um, he's just helping the patients use asynchronous telemedicine. And usually the, the catchment area is for the patients who are already using the pharmacies. But maybe I was misinterpreting a one minute as only one minute contact, but it's just a very, very quick way of getting access. Yes, so, yes. Well, thank goodness for that. Because uh, <laughs> No, the physician will see you for more than one minute, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's called that. That's what you call it there in the States. <laughs> yeah, okay. and, and Hoda, can I just slip in a question here? Because I'm not sure, sure if there's other ones in, in the chat. Um, when, in your presentation, you mentioned about the fact that uh, you haven't done an exercise to look at the cost benefit of telemedicine, I think. Um, but um, one of my worries, and again, I'm sorry, I'm using the platform to ask a personal question, if you like, uh, is, is that a lot of the studies actually look at the benefits to the health organisations and the cost of, of providing health services without actually considering the costs very often to the patient. And obviously, one of the benefits of telehealth is that a lot of patients can access services at a distance, which means not having to travel, sometimes not having to travel with an accompanying person, a carer and so forth. Um, I mean, if you do do an evaluation, would you be looking at that broader context, do you think, where the benefits of patients as well yes, as of the course. The yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to be short in my presentation because of the 10 minute um, window. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have a, like a large study now uh, because uh, no one actually looked at the health economics part of medicine in general in Egypt. Uh, of course, a big defect. So um, as I was telling you, the virtual hospital is not just uh, interested in telemedicine. We're interested in any technology-enabled healthcare solutions. So uh, currently, we are doing a, a, a geographic um, uh, study where we're looking at the catchment area of Ain Shams University as a university, and then at the catchment area of the telemedicine services. And we have also on board a health economics uh, professor that's helping us uh, put the methodology to make sure that um, those people who are not traveling large distances, is it cost effective or not? Currently, the patients are not paying. So this is not the best time to, to make sure. But there is reimbursement for the physician. So I, I'm sure he can put down um, a, a, a methodology for research to make sure that it is cost effective if the patient pays, uh, for example, from uh, so and so uh, pounds. So it's an ongoing um, challenge. This is one of our challenges in Egypt that a lot of work that maybe many countries are advanced in, we don't have the basic knowledge to be able to support what we've done. So maybe this is why accreditation was a very strong uh, pusher for us. Um, it gave us um, a lot of um, 
the credibility with the administration that we want to do this study, they're going to pay. Please um, reimburse the physicians, now they're paying. In the beginning, they weren't so sure that we're doing something useful. <laughs> Okay, and uh, just one of the points that when thinking about the issues of traveling and reduced yeah. traveling, uh, it's appropriate just to mention that reduced traveling means a, a smaller carbon footprint, doesn't it? And uh, in, in the week of the uh, May big conference in, in Glasgow, I think that's a very important issue for us all and, and perhaps needs to be built into some of these um, cost evaluations. Um, there is a, a kind of statement, an implicit uh, question um, in the chat, and uh, perhaps Sean, you could uh, address this. Is that Asking really what types of medicine are great for telehealth, and by the way, this is probably the last, or if there's one really good question, we might pick it up. This is probably the last um, word we have time for. Well, based upon the experience in the United States right now, um, there, there have already been studies done on the economics in certain specialties. Uh, among the leaders in that are, are uh, chronic conditions such as diabetes and, and chronic kidney care, where, where a uh, periodic physical examination is necessary, but not for every visit when you're checking on someone with chronic diseases. And there's also an emerging set of, of uh, studies around behavioral health and the, the fact that behavioral health offering new access points for people with behavioral health issues or, or, or chronic behavioral uh, diseases and substance use uh, treatment is an area where you have a decreased stigma because you're not going in a door that somebody might see you uh, and those sort of things. So we're, we're, there are some very good economic studies around the, the cost benefits of, of, studies in, of, of studies in those areas in particular. Okay, and a quick comment from there, being a psychologist on that about people with mental health issues. I presume that's what we were talking about here. We just use different terminology, I think. Yes, exactly. That would be great if this would be a part of our practice here in Slovenia, I believe everywhere, because now, especially in COVID uh, situation that uh, 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 this type of uh, issues uh, were quite went really high and especially among young uh, people and this uh, you know they they don't have a problem with uh, technology they would uh, welcome probably any kind of application support network that would be available and maybe that there is available so we were actually thinking about in in is risk to develop one uh, some some sort of application for you in this regard yes and thank you very much for that. And just as a quick aside, bearing in mind that diabetes has been mentioned, we have focused to some extent on older people, but of course diabetes is something for the full age range as well. And, uh, and obviously some possibly some growing problems for the future, much younger people with diabetes and obesity and things like that. Anyway, uh, not enough time to talk about that uh, at the moment. Um, uh, can I pass back to yourself, uh, Jefferson, uh, just for a few final words? Um, but my personal thanks to all the speakers, by the way, and the discussion, really great. Thank you. Jefferson, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Malcolm. And I also would like to thank all the speakers of this webinar, uh, to Hoda, Caroline, Dea, and Sean, and to you, Malcolm, as our facilitator. Uh, all of you have done a great job. I think um, moments like this are very important for those who are you know, trying to learn or trying to check what their experience are and what they could do. And this uh, moment of sharing knowledge, experience, and visions is very important and is one of the aims of the education program of the National Society. It's one of the aims of the International Society to bring opportunities like this. I thank you also for the participants, for the attendees. I hope they have enjoyed it as I did. And I hope to see you in another meeting of the International Society. And this one, I would like to thank especially to Jurek and uh, to Sean and the team, Lisa and Lauro and Frederick from the International Society for all the support that you have. So all the best for you all, keep safe, and let's meet another time. Bye-bye.